Happy Resurrection Day. I don't know how I can top the worship service and the testimonies, but I have a, have a word for you this morning. I'm excited to share it. If I could just have you all stand up. I want you to uh, honor God's word, the truth of God's word. I feel like there's a lot of standing up and yelling and, and screaming about things that are insignificant. I think it's important to, for us to stand up and honor God's word, God's truth. Amen? When truth seems to be assaulted every day of the week, I think it's important for us to stand up for biblical truth, even more now than, than ever. So we just want to honor God's word this morning. I'd like to open with a passage in Matthew 28, 1 through 7. The subtitle of my Bible says, Jesus has risen. Amen. And after the Sabbath at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. I love that. He he like rolled it back and sat on it, crossed his legs. His appearance was like lightning. His clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, do not be afraid for I know you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He's not here. He has risen just as he said, come and see the place where he lay, then go quickly and tell his disciples, he has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee, there you will see him, now I have told you, amen. You can sit down, unless you want to stand up the whole service. We know that that Jesus' death, resurrection, conquered the power of death, not just in him, but in us all. Spiritual death and physical death. Now we will one day die, but we know that we live eternally with him. We shed the old body, and and many of us are gonna be really, really happy about that. We shed the old body, and we get a new body when we come to the new heavens and earth, but it's gonna be a physical body, but it's gonna be a spiritual body. When we get saved, it's the first miracle that happens in our lives. We get saved and we get a new perspective on life. Something fills us, we have clarity, about life, we have a hope that we never had, and we can unpack all the wrong things that we've done, and we, just, and we feel forgiven. That's the first supernatural thing that happens to you when you make Jesus the Lord of your life. We're destined to have new, new bodies and a new heaven and a new earth. It's something that we can look forward to. So all the aches and pains and struggles, he turns them into blessing. Isn't that awesome? We, we are only living in a moment. This is just a temporary blip. In eternity, when you think about eternity, eternity, that's like a long time. That's thousands and thousands and millions and millions of years. Your lifespan is just a blip. So while your, your pain is temporary, you're going to experience blessing and provision for eternity. Amen? That's what his death and resurrection accomplished. But Jesus didn't just rise from the dead and take off. It says in Acts that he hung out for 40 days, or at least he made appearances for 40 days. I want to talk to you this morning about those 40 critical days. And they're critical because, well, first of all, Jesus found it important for him to hang out for another 40 days before he ascended. And as we read the end of the Gospels and we read the beginning of Acts, we clearly get a picture as to why it was so important that Jesus hung out for 40 days. I mean, picture this. You're, you're an owner of, the, of an influential business, a very profitable business, and you're going away for a year, okay? Not as long as Jesus went away, thousands of years, but you're going away for a year. And you're leaving this business to trusted men and women to run while you're gone. You're going to be absent. You, no one, they can't call you. You've you got to trust these men and women to run your business, right? So you get them in all, all in a boardroom. You're giving them last-minute instructions, and you look in their face, and all you see is worry, fear, and disillusionment. Well, that's the disciples. Here we have Jesus resurrecting from the dead. He told them he was going to rise from the dead. When he, he makes his first appearances, they seem confused as to, like, they forgot that he was going to rise from the dead. So he's risen from the dead, and they're, they're still like, like oh, okay, you're back. Why, why are you back? Jesus had to clarify why he was back in those, those, those words that he shared with them and those message, messages that he, they, he shared with them were of the utmost importance. They were important for the disciples then and they're important for us. 
But you're not going to just be able to open a page of the Bible and see all the things that he taught the disciples because you'll, you'll have a hard time. You have to dig. You have to dig a little bit. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring out some of those important things, important instructions that he gave the disciples this morning because they are just as important to us. I'm going to open with Acts 1, 1 through 9 and just read to you. You can just sit there and listen or open your Bibles. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. After giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen, after his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father has promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. I want to note, they were saved already. Jesus was talking about another event, that they needed to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. They gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you still going to restore the kingdom of Israel? I don't know if you were paying attention when I was reading. Jesus was not talking about the kingdom of Israel. They were obviously fixated on something else and everything Jesus said went over their head. They gathered and said, Lord, is it time to restore the kingdom of Israel? Very patient Jesus is. He said, it is not for you to know the times or the dates. The Father has set by his own authority but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be witnesses in Jerusalem in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their eyes and a cloud hid from their sight. There are four very important things just in this passage, uh, passage of scripture that give reference to other things that Jesus spoke, but important things that we need to capture this morning because it should propel us. It should be the reason why we are living why we're still alive, why are we li- why, while we are living the next 40 days or 40 years of our life, these are our instructions from our Savior. In that passage, it says that he gave commandments to the apostles through the Holy Spirit. We'll dig into exactly what commandments they were. And it said that he presented himself alive by many infallible truths. Not only did he appear to the disciples, there were many people that he appeared to. He appeared to 500 people at one time. There were other appearances that I'm sure were not recorded in scripture. And there are other historians that were, we would consider atheist historians that reported that, that they saw Jesus or they, they got testimony from people who saw Jesus. So there's, there's always this complaint, well, it's only the Gospels and in Acts that, that this resurrected Jesus has talked about. That's not true. There's, men, there's a whole lot of historical evidence that this actually happened. But you still, for us, it's a, we just have to take a step of faith, and many of us have, and we have an experiential relationship with Jesus Christ, not just up here, but he's changed everything in our life. And then he said he spoke on things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Uh, just real quick, there's nothing that Jesus taught before this moment that was not about the kingdom of God. All his teachings from the Sermon on the Mount onward through the Gospels was teaching about the kingdom of God. He was clarifying what was written in the Old Testament, what the prophets were speaking about. This is what they were, this is what they were speaking about. This is what it was pointing to. He was telling them what the Old Testament really meant. And we know that the, the Pharisees were constantly getting tripped up on this. They were people of the law but they were legalistic, manipulative, controlling individuals who didn't have a relationship, not all of them, but the ones that Jesus directed his his correction to certainly were. They were deceived, they were manipulative, and they had no idea what the kingdom of God was all about. And Jesus would share to the disciples and all those who would listen what the kingdom of God meant. And he demonstrated and taught he demonstrated, taught about, and confirmed the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's pretty obvious the difference between the disciples through the Gospels and the disciples after the day of Pentecost. So something happened to them, and what happened to them was the Holy Spirit. I want to talk about some of the instructions of the commandments that Jesus gave. Uh, at the end of Matthew and actually at the end of Mark, he gives what we call the Great Commission. So if you're wondering why you're still here and what you're to do as a Christian, this is very simple. You're to make disciples of all the nations. You're to baptize in the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit. 
a lot of, a lot of Christians downplay water baptism. I think this is probably a little more important than we think it is because these were part of Jesus' last commands in his 40 days. He says, I want people baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. He was, he was also recognizing the three persons of the Trinity. So he was, he was, he was propping up the Trinity and you're going to get baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. This is a significant spiritual moment. It is not about just giving a testimony. So I'm telling you, if you are Christians here have you not, that, and you have not been water baptized, it's not too late. I don't care if you've been saved 10 years, you need to get water baptized. Because I know, and many know who testify it, when you're water baptized, there's, some, there's a spiritual transaction that this takes place. I know people that were physically healed when they went into the water. I know people that have had revelation and in, in, in vision. So it's very important. So if you haven't been water baptized, you need to get water baptized. And also, he also taught them to observe all things that I have commanded. So everything that I've commanded, everything that I taught you, you need to teach others to do the same. So go and make disciples. Secondly, Jesus commanded them to wait in Jerusalem for the Holy Spirit. This is, this is what he always knew that they needed, but he really knew that they needed it during those 40 days when they looked mystified every time he looked at them, when he would give them instructions and they kept reverting back to, so when are you going to restore the kingdom of Israel? So he knew that they needed the Holy Spirit, and that's why he said, don't go anywhere, don't say anything, don't do anything until you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which is another baptism. You're saved, you get water baptized, and there's another infilling of the Holy Spirit. If you get offended by baptized in the Holy Spirit, then use something else. You need a constant infilling of the Holy Spirit. How many of you need less of the Holy Spirit in your life? Yeah, I didn't think so. So you need more. You need constant infilling of the Holy Spirit. Thirdly, in Acts 10.42, Jesus has commanded his disciples to preach. What do they preach? They preach the gospel. What's the gospel? The death and resurrection and the ascension of Jesus Christ and everything that he taught and he clarified with regards to the law and the prophets. Remember, when Jesus taught the disciples, there was no New Testament. He taught the disciples out of the Old Testament. So some of you probably haven't read the Old Testament in a very long time. I want to encourage you to read the Old Testament because those words are also Jesus's words. The things, the things, the kingdom, the Messiah, all the things that, that the Old Testament was pointing to was Jesus in the New Testament. Jesus is the Old Testament clarified and made clear. Remember, he didn't make, come to make it obsolete. He came to fulfill the Old Testament. He was the fulfillment of everything that's contained in the Old Testament. He expounded on things in the Old Testament Point, and it pointed to him on the road to Emmaus when he was talking to Cleopas and, and whoever Cleopas was walking with. He was, he was talking and clarifying scripture that they knew from the Old Testament. And it says that, they were, that, that, that their hearts were burning. John 20, 22 says, again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them, received the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you, if you do not forgive, then they are not forgiven. Jesus gave the, the disciples here a foretaste of the Holy Spirit. Remember, he breathed on them the Holy Spirit. This was before the day of Pentecost. So there's, there's constant necessary and filling of the Holy Spirit, and he knew that they needed more. There was a spiritual event that had to happen in a disciple's life. There's a spiritual event that has to happen in your life. And it doesn't just come by evidence of speaking in tongues. I know some people say that. That could be the primary evidence, but I know people who move in the gifts of the Spirit, who've received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and they've never spoken tongues. But they have the gift of healing or revelation or prophecy. There are spiritual gifts available, only made available if you've been baptized in the Holy Spirit. You don't have to fall on the ground to get baptized in the Holy Spirit. Sometimes you do. Many times you don't. I know many people that have experienced none of those events, but they move in the gifts of the Spirit because they have faith to believe in the gifts of the Spirit and they allow the Holy Spirit to operate in their lives. Don't you want that? That's what more the Holy Spirit brings. All the cool stuff. I'm sure he clarified the importance of love. When asked by the, by the Pharisee, what's the most important commandment? What did Jesus say? 
love the Lord God with all your heart and your mind and your soul. And the second is just like the first commandment, the greatest commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. And, and Paul emphasized this, it sums up everything. It sums up all the law, all the prophets, all the commandments. I can guarantee if you can remember this, if you love God with everything that you have, you, you realize that you're all stewards, you, you love him and honor him with everything that you have, you'll find it easier to love your neighbor and love your enemy. And if you learn to love like God, you won't have to remember any of the other commandments. I like that. I'm fairly simple-minded. I can't remember all the commandments. But if I can remember, love, love God and love people, you'll, you'll, you'll obey the other commandments because disobeying some of the other commandments, lying, cheating, stealing, gossiping, that's not love. Easy, right? So kids, all you need to remember, love God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and love your neighbor just like you love God, including your enemy. And you can do that with the power of the Holy Spirit. So why and whom did he present the infallible truths? There were over 12 times that it's recorded in Scripture that Jesus appeared. Some people counted 10. I counted 12. I, I came up with two more. But it, I'm sure that he appeared more than, more than 12 times, but it's only the 12 times that's recorded over a 40-day period. He had to convince them that he was alive. And obviously, by the, by the disciples' response and everybody's response, the convincing was important, and he provided infallible truths. So much so, he would have Thomas, doubting Thomas, touch the wounds. Remember Thomas doubted that he was there? Well, you could see my wounds, touch my wounds. So Jesus had a physical body, but it was a glorified body. I'll touch on this in a minute, in a minute but he was physically there. It wasn't a vision, it wasn't an apparition. He was actually there physically, but he was in a glorified body. And of course, he made the appearances to build the disciples' faith. Because remember, the disciples' faith was shattered. Our Messiah, our Savior, is dead, and he's still dead. But now he's risen from the dead. He needed to provide proof that he was alive and he was real. And it wasn't a ghost. The first person he went to was Mary Magdalene. I love, I love this, and I love her story. I wish I could knew more about her backstory, but we know this. She was a woman that had seven demons. Whatever that manifested into being, whether it was sickness or disease or hallucinations, it was, it was bad news. She had seven demons. Jesus delivered her of seven demons. I think she was pretty grateful. I think she had a lot of faith that Jesus could rise from the dead. She's the first person that Jesus saw. Then there were two people. One was Cleopas on the road to Emmaus, then to Peter. And I love that because what was Peter's kind of last event? It wasn't wasn't great. I'm sure he wouldn't want you to remember it, but he denied Christ three times. So Jesus went to Peter, I think, to restore him, to tell him that he still loved him. Then the 10 disciples in the upper room without Thomas, then the 11 disciples with Thomas, which is when Thomas, I don't know if you've seen the painting, I can't remember who painted it, but it shows Thomas putting his finger in Jesus's wounds. Yuck. It's okay, I believe. The seven the disciples while they were fishing in a lake. And I love, I love this. He didn't just teach them. He hung out with them. He went fishing with them. He shows up when they're fishing and he says, throw the net on the other side. I'll help you, I'll help you catch more fish. So they do that. They catch more fish. The disciples before the ascension on the Mount of Olives. And then in 1 Corinthians 15, 6, it says that he appeared to more than 500 people at a time, just in case people were starting to doubt, he appears to 500 people at one time. By the way, other non-Christian historians report that, that he, that, that he appeared to all these different people. And then, of course, James, Jesus' brother, he appeared to. So he encouraged weeping Peter, he restored, or weeping Mary, he restored fallen Peter. He welcomed doubting Thomas. He instructed the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. He met the discouraged disciples and ate with them. So he obviously had a physical body if he was going to eat with them, right? He met the disciples on the mountain in Galilee, and he even cooked breakfast breakfast for them by the Sea of Galilee. That's the Jesus I know. He's touchable, real. Amen? So why did Jesus have to talk more about the kingdom? It said that he was speaking things pertaining to the kingdom. Well, because they didn't understand. Because they thought the kingdom was about the kingdom of Israel. 
and that he was going to be a warrior king. He was going to ride on a horse and he was going to have a sword and he was going to cut off the heads of Romans and he was going to restore Israel to its former glory. That was not the kingdom that Jesus came to establish. There will one day be a physical kingdom, a new heavens and a new earth where there'll be no more sin, there'll be no more pain, but it wasn't now and it wasn't for the disciples and it's not for us now. We're to live out a different kingdom and that's the kingdom that's within us. So he had to reinforce the idea of this kingdom within. He spent 40 days teaching them about the kingdom as he did before the three plus years, teaching them about the kingdom and the kingdom values and how how to operate in the kingdom, how to operate in kingdom values, how to operate in kingdom authority, how to move into the gifts of the spirit, none of which they would have understood if it wasn't for the Holy Spirit, giving them revelation, but also giving them power. Jesus was ruled by a kingdom that was within him. He wanted his disciples and all of us to be ruled by the same sort of kingdom that was within him. So what was the importance of the Holy Spirit? Acts 1, 7 through 9, it says that he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you shall receive the power of the Holy Spirit when he comes on you. And you will be witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their eyes and a cloud hid them from their sight. And they just stood there and stared, by the way. Didn't receive the gift of the Holy, or the baptism of the Holy Spirit yet. So they, they're, they're standing there until the angels had to jerk them out of their stupor and say, okay, now, now, now go to the upper room. And, and by the way, go straight there. Don't do anything else. Go straight to the upper room. And we know what happened as we read through Acts on the day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit shows up, tongues of fire above their head, and they are completely radically changed as evidenced by Peter's first awesome, incredible sermon where, Jesus, where Peter began to speak like Jesus spoke and began to unpack the Old Testament scripture verses. This is also kind of cool. I mentioned, I touched on the fact that Jesus had a glorified body. Remember when he shows up to Mary, he said, he told Mary not to touch him. I think, I think he ascended, I think he was ascending and descending probably quite often during those 40 days. I don't have, I don't have proof of that, but he did let Thomas touch his, touch his hands later on. So something happened in, in, in between there. The final ascension, we know what the final ascension was when he sat at the right hand of the Father, but he would, appear and disappear. He had to go somewhere. He could have been visiting other people, but um, it's very possible he was was hanging out with his father also. He ate food, so we know it's a physical body, but it was a glorified body. It did not have the limitations that we have. It didn't have the limitations that he had before his resurrection. Did you ever read about Jesus walking through walls and disappearing? Now, he walked on water. He did things like that. But, but other, other than that, he didn't do the things that he did in his glorified body. It seems like that glorified body had different abilities that his, his human fleshly body that was subject to death because he died, right? But he was risen from the dead, was not subject to anymore. It's a picture of what we're going to get. That's what's exciting to me. I mean, it's cool that Jesus had it, but it's super cool that we're going to get a glorified body. No longer pain, suffering, depression, anxiety, fear. Someday, we'll we'll never deal with that again. We'll get a new glorified body. Hope mine looks a little different. Hopefully, they won't call me Skinny Dave anymore. None of you feel bad for me when I say that, but that's the nickname my kids gave me when we had a couple days working for us. They had to come up with a nickname for me, and they said, we'll call you Skinny Dave. Thank you, boys. 1 Corinthians 15, 42 through 44 says, so also is the resurrection of the dead. Speaking of what Jesus experienced, it is sown in corruption, it is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown in the natural body, it is raised in a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body Jesus would appear and disappear at will because he had a spiritual body and a natural body. We will get a natural body. We won't be floating in the clouds. We won't have wings. But we, it, it appears if our glorified body is anything like Jesus' body, and I, I absolutely believe that's a picture of our body, we will have the same abilities that he had. Why? 
because we get a glorified body and the same Holy Spirit that enables him to do that is in us. So if you're not looking forward to anything in this life, you can at least look forward to that. I want to walk through a wall. I've tried it. It does not work. Not in this body. It was not until the Holy Spirit filled them that they had the courage to leave the upper room. After this, Peter could finally preach. Without stumbling over his words, by, without the shame of denying Christ, Peter could preach. Not only could he preach, he understood what he was preaching. Peter didn't preach like this before. Peter would only open his mouth around the disciples to talk about who was, who was the greatest among them. You know, but now... It was like Jesus' words were coming out of his mouth because he was getting revelation from the Holy Spirit. It says that signs and wonders followed the, the disciples wherever they went. People were healed, delivered from demons. Shadows, the shadows of the disciples, that shadow was the Holy Spirit. The shadow of the disciples healed people as it passed over them. There were rags, dirty rags that were picked up, that were, that were p- touched by the disciples, by, by Paul, and they were healed because the anointing was so heavy on them. And by the way, you get a picture of this when Jesus resurrected from the dead because he wasn't the only one. Scripture talks about other people that were resurrected from the dead when Jesus was resurrected. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. It wasn't just for Jesus, it's for us. In his resurrection, life is in us. You heard testimony about that this morning. People getting healed of cancer and seizures and all sorts of stuff. Many of you, how many of you have here, how many of you have experienced supernatural healing in your life? Raise your hand. I'm raising my hand. That's called resurrection life. That's called NOS gas, the Holy Spirit on steroids. That's, that's, that's the Holy Spirit in you that causes you to do that. And he can do that. The more you step out in faith, the more that you can believe, the more you begin to walk and move in these gifts. And those gifts come from the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit brings salvation. He gives us a new heart. He replaces a stony heart with a spiritual heart, which activates our spiritual man. Those of you can remember before when you were a worldly man and woman, you didn't have Jesus the way that you thought. The despair that you had, the frustration, the lack of hope, and you got saved, and all of a sudden, wow, it's like I got a new mind. I have new hope. The spiritual man was switched on in you. You have courage, or you can have courage that you've never had. You can have an understanding of Scripture. As much as I know Scripture, as much as I read the Word, whenever I open my Bible, I pray, Holy Spirit, give me knowledge, give me revelation. That way, every time you open it up, it's not a boring devotional. You're not just reading words. The words come alive, and I believe the Holy Spirit can make those words come alive. So don't give up reading your Bible. Oh, it's so boring. It doesn't have to be boring. Ask the Holy Spirit to make it exciting. And Jesus is patient. He was super patient with them. You're in the same boat. He's going to be really patient with you. Holy Spirit gives revelation, visions. He gives the fruits of the Spirit. This is neglected teaching in Scripture. I think we should have a whole lot more teaching on the fruits of the Spirit before we talk about the gifts of the Spirit. Because you can get the gifts of the Spirit and not have the fruit of the Spirit and abuse people. And I've seen that happen. So you want to study something? Study the fruits of the Spirit. The, It's in Galatians 5.22. It is the character of the Holy Spirit. You need the character of the Holy Spirit to know how to use the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And the gifts of the Holy Spirit are all the cool stuff, but don't neglect the character because the cool stuff will go to your head. In a haughty spirit before the fall. So I want to conclude with this passage of Scripture in Matthew 28, 18 through 20. It's the Great Commission that the disciples heard, and it's the great commission that Jesus has for you. And if you're wondering, and you're one of those Christians who feels a little stuck, or you feel the weight of the world, you're confused by the same things that the world is confused by, it's because you lack clarity on what you've been called here to do. Because the world, this world can crumble around you, but you don't have to crumble, and you can have hope. But you have to be going after the right things. You have to know what your job description is. For some of you, you don't know what your job description is. You've forgotten what it is. And I want to share with you what it is. And these are Jesus' words. He came to them and he said this, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Where's Jesus? 
He's at the right hand of the Father. What's he doing? He's not doing crossword puzzles up there. It says he's at the right hand of the Father making intercession for the saints. Why? Because they're constantly getting into trouble? Partly because of that. But the intercession is answering our prayers as we pray to him. The authority that Jesus has, he's given to us. He imparts to us. If we ask him to reveal the mysteries, if we ask him to impart those things to us, we can move in the same authority that Jesus had. Jesus said, you can do these gifts and greater works will you do because the same Holy Spirit that was in him is gonna be in you. And I'm at the right hand of the Father, by the way, defeated sin and death, just saying. And I will activate you to live the life that I led the example for. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And just so you know, the end of the age has not happened yet. The end of the age when Jesus returns, it will be a very different story than the first time he was here. There will be a reckoning, finally, of sin, evil, corruption, and it will be rid of this world and God will give us a new heaven and a new earth and a glorified body to live in. And this earth is gonna look very different. You're gonna look very different. I might still be skinny, Dave. But we're gonna get a glorified body and trust me, we're not gonna be insecure. We're not gonna be suffering from PTSD. We're not gonna be suffering from depression, pain, sickness, cancer. It's all gonna be gone. But until then, we have a job to do. Amen? I want to close with this. There may be some of you who are watching online who are in here because you often get people investigating things on Easter. And I'm glad that you're here. I think God led you here. You may not know anything about Jesus. Maybe, maybe what I taught today is completely new to you, but you're sensing like this, this drawing. You're sensing that I want to know this Jesus more. I want you to know this Jesus more. So I want everyone to bow their heads. You don't have to pray this out loud. It's not some sort of magical prayer, but it is a decision to make Jesus the Lord of your life. It's a step of faith that you want to know this Jesus. And I can guarantee you this, that if you make a serious commitment to make him Lord of your life, your life will change for the better. It does not mean you won't experience pain. Jesus actually pro promises us persecution, struggle, and pain because we're still in a fleshly body. We're still corrupted by sin and death, but it does promise us that we'll spend eternity with him and we'll get a new glorified body. And if you want that today, I want to offer it to you. And all you have to do is make a commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. So repeat these words after me. Jesus, I don't even know all of what this means but I know that I've done things that are wrong. I think things that are wrong. I've done wrong things to people. I've said wrong things to people and I feel guilt and I feel shame and I feel conviction. And I don't know what to do about this. And I heard that you can take it all away, that you forgive me of my sins and that you will get me in touch with my creator who's the father of all and the creator of all things. He's Yahweh. It's the God that's spoken of in the Old Testament and it's the God that we see so clearly in Jesus Christ in the new. I receive you. I wanna make you Lord of my life. Help me to make these positive steps in my life so that I can understand what my purpose is and so I can have the hope that everybody's been singing about and getting excited about this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.